In the last few years, renting your personal car has absolutely blown up in popularity as a side hustle. There's a lot of people out there even claiming that it's the best side hustle to do nowadays. Today we'll be talking to Aubrey who is a Turo expert and has over a dozen cars on the platform. We're going to see how much profit you can potentially make with this as a side hustle and what is needed to get started making profit with Turo in your city today. The interview is going to be timestamped, so feel free to jump to certain sections of the video. Also, a huge thanks to Aubrey for all the great advice and tips during the interview. Please show her some love and check out her great videos all about Turo and different side hustles on her channel. Now let's jump right into the interview. All right, awesome. Now we're just jumping over to the interview. And the first question we have is how long you've been renting cars on Turo? So I started Turo in 2017. So it's coming up on five years, I, I guess, as of right now, technically like four and a half. Oh, wow. And how many vehicles do you have? 15 currently. So 15 on Turo. And then we also have two RVs as well that we rent out on a different platform. So a 17 car car sharing fleet. Cool. And then how many like, cars did you originally start with? Just one. So I used my personal car, which was a 2011 Jeep Wrangler. Oh, nice. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. One of my first cars were a uh, Jeep Wrangler as well. 2000. Oh, nice. Or no, 1997 and 1998. But yeah, great cars. I really did not like it, which is why I rented really? it out on Turo. Funny enough. Yeah, I was, a, I'm a huge 4Runner fangirl. I love Toyota. And so I went from driving a Toyota 4Runner and then um, I had a Jeep Wrangler that was like my first car that I bought myself. I hated it. And that's part of the reason why I was so embracing of Turo. Cause I was like, you know, this is a great way for me to rent out this car that I just hate. <laughs> and then I can go back to driving my, my forerunner, which I love. And yeah, I'm still driving that forerunner today. <laughs> <laughs> that's cool. And then, yeah. So I feel like a lot of people, first time they do anything, uh, whether it's like Turo, Airbnb, they're always afraid, especially when it's their own property. So I guess they kind of helped that. I guess you weren't a fan of the Jeep. So was that easier than taking the plunge into the deep end with renting it out then? I'd like to say yes, but I think, I think that I am definitely like one of those people for better or for worse. I like ask for forgiveness, not for permission on a lot of stuff. And so I have a tendency to be like, you know what, who cares if, if something happens to it, it happens, we'll address that whenever it comes. And so I, I probably think if I loved the car, I probably wouldn't have rented out, but I probably would have been optimistic with it, even if I liked the car. But yeah, I mean, I, I think the fact that I, I really didn't like it probably, probably helped the mindset shift quite a bit. <laughs> So yeah, my, my follow-up question then is like, why did you pick Turo instead of other side hustles? It kind of sounded like it fell in your lap with going back to not really being a fan of the car. Was there other reasons why you really wanted to jump into this side hustle? I mean, it's not, yeah. I mean, so there, there's a lot of different reasons. I, I think that with, with Turo, I, I, I wouldn't say that there's a, it's, it's the question of choosing Turo of, of over other side hustles, because I definitely think that I, I am a person that my income comes from kind of a lot of different side hustles. I don't do anything 40 hours per week. I do a lot of things, you know, 10 to 20 hours per week, which results in working way more than 40 hours, but there's just like kind of a bunch of different side hustles out there. And whenever I, I got started with Turo, it, it became a side hustle that I really embraced because it just made sense for what I was wanting to do. I had found Turo through a, a friend who at the time was doing marketing for a different business that I had. He was doing my internet marketing. He had told me about Turo. I was like, you know, this is perfect. I'm going to try this out with the Jeep. And then it was just like, being able to see the passivity of the business model. I'm, I like cars. My fiance who, who helps run the business today, he's very smart with cars. And so kind of putting the pieces together, it was like, this is the perfect side hustle. And then I leaned into it just because of the passivity of it. Okay. So yeah, kind of combination, everything also plays into yeah your interests. And then also, I guess, already having the car to already put up. So yeah, a little bit of everything combines into yeah. it. Yeah. All right. That makes a lot of sense. And then I guess what kind of car makes like you know, the best kind of inventory to list on Turo is it sounds like the Wrangler, which is, you know, like personally having it, it didn't have a lot of space. It had absolutely no trunk. Um, so it sounds like you could put like something utility or go county or even like sports cars or like, what would you recommend? I mean, I think you can put a lot of things and be really successful with it. I mean, for, for me, my business model that I, I definitely promote most is low end economy cars. It's definitely like what my channel is focused on the most. It's what I've promoted a lot as being a successful business model, which is the idea of buying cash cars for, 
I mean, back in the day, whenever I was getting started, I was buying $2,500 cars, but unfortunately those days are over <laughs> with the current car market. So now it's like $5,000 cars, $6,000 cars, things like that. And so that's what I do. And I found a lot of success with, but to be honest, I mean, you could rent a wide variety of different cars from sports cars. I, I had a Maserati on the platform for a while that was wrecked. You could do sports cars. You could do Jeeps. You could do SUVs. It really depends on your market. Different markets are going to dictate different cars, but I think in general, kind of going with that normal low end economy car and the research that I've done with Turo, you can't go wrong with that business model. Okay. So maybe like the best way to start is get a, like a low end economy car. And then if you want kind of grow into different sectors of uh, Turo, then would you recommend that then? I would say experiment first with the car that you own, like whatever car is the easiest car for you to get your hands on that I think is the best route to pursue because the reality is, is that Turo isn't for everyone. I think it can be for a lot for a lot of people, but there are some people that either don't like it there. It's just something that they're not interested in. And I'm always an advocate of going in with your personal car first, because you don't want to get a car loan or buy a car, get started on Turo for a month. And then you're like, eh, I don't know if this is for me. And so starting with your own car kind of gets your feet wet and it figures out, okay, how can I proceed with this side hustle in a really strategic way? And then from there you can buy cars. And then I would say, as far as how you expand, I would say find your niche and then kind of stick to that. If that niche is, for example, I know somebody out of New Jersey that has only Teslas. He has like 40 Teslas in his fleet. For me, I have 15 low-end economy cars and I, I low-end, but they're pretty nice economy cars, but they're very average, normal economy cars. I know other people that have, you know, 10, 15 SUVs. And so I would say stick to what you know and kind of diversify strategically outwards from that. Okay. Yeah. I think that's some several great points right there. I think the first one too, kind of like bootstrapping the whole thing, who knows, say if you were, were to go out and purchase the car, you know, who knows if you even like this side hustle or you have too many headaches. So I think utilizing what you have is a great way to start about, start about it and then figure out if you want to expand. Yeah. I mean, a hundred percent. And I think that there's also the entire issue of you know, developing your processes, making sure that this is something that's sustainable and scalable for your lifestyle. Because Turo for, for me, and I think for a lot of people, it works really well with your lifestyle. But for example, one thing I've talked about on my channel a lot is the idea that if you travel a lot, Turo probably isn't a great side hustle for you. And so if you're like traveling off for work, if you're going on vacation every weekend, it may not be a good choice. And so you need to kind of play around with those factors. And I think the best way to do that is with your personal car. Okay. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And then you kind of already touched on this, but what's like a typical cost for a Turo car? You were saying before the pandemic, an economy car might go for 2,500, but nowadays you're potentially seeing that car for 5,000. Was that what you mentioned? Yeah. I mean, that that's pretty accurate. Part of it is because over the years, just as I've become more busy. Um, before the pandemic, I, I wasn't quite, my schedule wasn't quite as tight as it is today. And so back in the day, whenever I didn't have the money and I, I was really, truly bootstrapping it, I had to, and I say I, but everything is with my fiance who helped me through this process. And so it's the two of us, but the two of us had to really go and find these cars for as cheap as possible. It was like, if a car was running and if it had a clean title, we were interested in buying it and then we would fix it ourselves. And so a lot of times that resulted in buying these you know, 2,300, I think the cheapest car we ever bought was 2,200. So buying these really cheap cars and then fixing them up. And those same cars are probably going for like 4,500 today. But then even the cars that I buy are kind of the next step above that, just because I don't have the time to, to spend, you know, 20, 30 hours fixing a car anymore. And so, but I, I would say you can very realistically buy a car for Turo for five grand. Like you're going to have to be patient. You're going to have to look out for good deals, but you can find them for sure. Okay. And then what kind of like locations are you looking to like purchase the car? Is it directly from another like uh, person that owns it? So like Craigslist for uh, Facebook marketplace, or are you actually going to like dealers and auctions? We do directly with, with Facebook and Craigslist. And so we will buy from most of it's small, like dealerships that are just kind of like one man operations that post their ads on Facebook. And so like not dealerships, but they have dealer licenses. And then the other portion is people just selling their car. And so that's what we do. We don't buy from dealerships typically because dealerships don't really sell the cars we're looking for. And then with auction cars, it's the entire mess of needing an auction license. And then you have to deal with the auction car. It's just not something we've done. Um, so yeah, we do Facebook and Craigslist. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. I know well, yeah, when I was in high school and college, I think I had a total of five cars and I purchased them all through Craigslist. And I, I didn't know too much about cars, but I would always bring a friend that knew quite a bit about cars. 
So I think that saved me a lot of headaches, you know, whether it's like, oh, this one's trash or has too much rust. And like, it would have been, you know, a money pit. So I think that's a good little tip for anyone who's looking to buy one. Oh, yeah. I I 100 percent agree with that. I think that you you need to make sure to definitely have somebody with you that knows cars or if, if you are just willing to do the research. I think that there's a lot that you can learn from YouTube and just like looking at videos of people doing car inspections and you learn like what to look out for, what kind of red flags are, what you need to keep in mind, and then it will help set you up for success. But yeah, I mean, I, I think to your point, there are a lot of people that buy a car not really knowing what they're looking for. And it is like, it, it's just, it's such a headache and it's such a money pit. Yep. Yeah. So that's definitely, if you get a boy I would try to do everything. Like you said, YouTube videos are bringing our friend out. Yeah. All right, awesome. So now let's say that we have a car, we're thinking about putting our own personal car on Turo. Like what else do we need in order to get started? I mean, really to get started, that's all you need. I mean, it's, it's the question of what do you need to get started? And that question is your car and that's pretty much it. But I think like whenever you get into the world of scaling the business, that's kind of where there, it does get a little bit more messy and there are things. And there is of course, like how risk adverse are you? I I mentioned a few moments ago that I'm, I pretty, like, I'm pretty, uh, risky with things that I do in the sense that like, I don't put a whole lot of thought into it. I'm just like, this will be fine. And so there are some people that get very squeamish of the idea of having their personal car without an LLC, without a commercial license. But whenever I got started with Turo, I, just got started with my personal car. I used my personal insurance. I used my personal car. Everything was in my personal name and and that's how I got started. Okay. Then, yeah, like you talked about, if you want to scale it up, maybe that's when you look into, you know, getting additional insurance or LLC and I guess really making it legal. Okay. Yeah. So, so I, I, at this point have commercial insurance and, and LLCs and things like that, but I didn't do that until I knew that Turo was what I wanted to do. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. And then I guess for is like insurance, do you have to tell your personal insurance company that you're doing Turo? I know at least for like Airbnb, I had to mention to them uh, for my homeowner's insurance. Is that the case with auto insurance as well then? So uh, insurance with Turo is kind of a tricky equation. So um, there are like per some personal insurance companies that are Turo friendly. For example, Liberty Mutual has a, has a Turo friendly policy. There's another company called Metro Mile that's also Turo friendly. And then like my commercial insurance that I have is Turo friendly as well. But it's kind of almost like an ask, don't tell type of thing, which is unfortunate because it feels a bit shady, but like you, you just kind of don't tell them, which is something that isn't great advice, but it's what a lot of new Turo hosts do because the vast majority of, of, of auto policies out there are not going to be okay with Turo. And so you kind of just don't, uh, you don't tell them and then you hope that they never find out. And then if they do find out, then you kind of address that whenever it comes. That's why kind of switching, like figuring out if Turo is something you want to do and then switching to these like Turo friendly systems is something that I, I always encourage people to do because insurance is definitely a, a tricky, tricky aspect. Okay. And that's most likely something, you know, you're going to have to worry about later. Like we talked about, if you're really going to scale and continue with Turo. So at least to get started. Yeah. It sounds like you don't have to really worry about it too much, at least in the beginning. Yeah. I mean, you, you, you definitely want to try to find one that's okay with sharing with peer to peer sharing. And there are ones that like, they, they may not be Turo friendly in the sense that they're not necessarily cool with it, but like, they're okay. Like they're aware that people do that type of thing and they'll adjust the policy accordingly. Like I believe insurance has something similar to that as well. So I, I definitely, I definitely would judge it on a case by case basis. And so I would say whenever it comes to insurance, do your due diligence and make sure that you're doing whatever you feel comfortable with, as well as whatever is an adherence to the Turo terms of service, which is a big, big thing to keep in mind. Okay. Yeah. I think that's a great point. And then kind of like leading on to our next question is how many hours a week do you spend like managing uh, just one car on Turo? So whether that's like communicating with the clients, uh, maintenance, and I guess everything else that goes into it. So for one car, it's very small. So at this point, um, like at this point in time, the vast majority of the heavy lifting with the fleet is done by my, my fiance and business partner. And so whenever we first started, I was the one who did virtually everything. And then last year he quit his job and took over that side of things. So he handles kind of the the labor stuff. And then I handle the admin work, but for, I would say like our time cumulatively with one car, it's probably not even an hour a week, like realistically. And so I would say it's, we probably spend about 15 to 20 hours per week on all 15 cars. And so, and that varies quite a bit, like some weeks it will be less, some weeks it might be a little bit more, but 
15 to 20 is pretty consistent with our 15. So I would say on average, probably about an hour for, for one car. Yeah, it's a lot less than I, I kind of was thinking in my head. I thought it would be a little bit more labor intensive, kind of like communicating with someone, but is a lot of it all automatic? I've rented cars on Turo before, but I can't remember if it's like the location's already sent to me. Um, so you don't have to worry about that then. So you can make it automatic. Turo recently um, like gave host this feature like within the last month, but there's been this tool out for a while called CarSync that does allow for you to automate the messages. And so it's like a third party app. So I use that. So 95% of all of my messages are automated. And then other than messages, it's pretty much the entire system is automated. Toll accumulation is automated. Messages are automated. The only thing that we do is, is upkeep the cars, which at this point we have the system down and the cars are, are pretty well maintained. And we have relationships with shops and then cleaning and taking photos, which doesn't take a lot of time. And so we've really developed the system to make it as efficient as possible. Oh, wow. So yeah, just building out systems really sounds like a reduced amount of hours. Did you, do you guys have to take pictures then of after every time someone rents the car? And is that just for like insurance purposes then? Yeah. So it has to be taken 24 hours before the rental and 24 hours after. And it's to ensure that if there's anything that happened, like an accident, smoking, a pet was left in the car, overage miles, gas, it, it's just to protect yourself to ensure that you can get reimbursed for your correct charges. Okay. And then even if you have like say 15 cars, that sounds like that could potentially be like a full-time job, but it sounds like it only takes like a few minutes then. Oh yeah. It's, it's quick. I mean, we do. So like how we do it is like, you literally just grab your phone, you like hold it up and then you just like walk around the car. Cause like with iPhones, you can kind of just hold it down. And so that's what we do. And it's super, super fast. It's, it's, if a car is, which I would say the vast majority of the time, the cars come back with needing a light cleaning, which like we have all the supplies in our, in our house, which is our shop. And so we have all the supplies there. I would say that we can get a car prepped and ready to go in less than 10 minutes, unless something has gone wrong, which like occasionally does happen, but the vast majority of the time, it's like just a light cleaning photos. It'll be in and out within 10 minutes. Oh, wow. So yeah, it definitely comes back to, you know, having down the system. So it doesn't really require too much time at the end of the day then. Yeah, exactly. That's awesome. And then I guess one other follow-up question I have is where do you have all your cars located? Are they near your house in the shop or are they kind of dispersed throughout the, you know, the Dallas suburbs and Dallas like downtown area? No. So they're just located in the, in the Dallas suburbs. And so I live out in, in Plano, Texas. And so it's, it's in the suburb of Dallas. And so we keep our cars in one location and the cars are located in a really convenient spot to where we live, which is also where her shop is. And so it's like, it makes it very, very efficient to where like guests can get to the car very easily. But then the shop that we use, the shop that we work out of, which is our garage is a few minutes away. The professional shop we use for major jobs is about 30 seconds away from there. The gas station uses 30 seconds. So it's like all within this one block so that it's very, very efficient. And it's, it's, really, it's really just a, a streamlined operation. Yeah, it seems like you guys literally thought about every little possible point. So we uh, have at this point, it wasn't originally like that, but things have worked out well. Yeah, that's awesome to hear. So I know like one of the big questions I'm going to get and even like comes to my mind is what happens when a customer damages your vehicle, whether that's like smokes in it, a pet, or even gets in like a bad car accident. Like, has this happened to you and yes. what have you done? Yes, many times. So we have had a, so like smoking and things like that is, is natural. Like it's going to happen. It used to happen a lot more, but Turo has been really cracking down on it and it doesn't happen that often. I would say maybe once a month, which I think across 15 cars, isn't that bad, but total losses and like accidents and things like that happen. In fact, we were on like a really bad total loss streak for four months where we had, um, or five months where we had four cars get totaled in five months. And which was like the most we had ever had by far. And basically what happens is like, this is something I talk about a lot on my channel is whenever you are with Turo, it's really important for you to have an understanding of the terms of service, because that's going to be like your Bible to protect you if anything happens. And so in the case of an accident or a smoking claim, you get reimbursed and you're allowed to be reimbursed up to a certain amount and smoking it's $250. In the case of gas, it's the cost of gas plus a $10 convenience fee. In the case of a total loss, it's the actual cash value of that car. And so as long as you are in a position where you follow the terms of service, you've done everything that you need to, you'll be covered. And, and I've been you know, a host since 2017. I have, I think, 2,300 trips on the platform, and I've never been denied a damage claim. And I think it's just because I just follow the terms of service to a team. 
Yeah, that's good to hear. I think that also gives a lot of trust to anyone that's thinking about potentially hosting on Turo that they actually do follow the claims and do pay out, so that's good to hear. And I guess one of my follow-up questions that I was planning on asking is, yeah, like what policies should new Turo car hosts be aware of when using the platform? Yeah, I mean, I would say kind of just the core ones that I, I think are most important is number one, make sure that you always take photos before and after a trip. This is something that people oftentimes don't like, and I've never really understood it because it doesn't take that long, but like you should have your, like my belief is like your eyes should be on a car once a day. Like if you have a car in your possession, that's ready to go out on a rental, like you should be looking at the car and taking photos of that car every day so that you have the photos ready to go if it gets rented out. And so, um, you can't like have a, even if a car doesn't move and it's more than 24 hours. So like if you have a car parked at your parking lot and then it doesn't get rented out for three days, but you had photos that you took three days ago and it hasn't moved since then. So the condition is the same, you still have to take those photos. And so the 24 hour rule for the photos is so important. And I think it's probably one of the ones that gets overlooked the most. Additionally is things like making sure you're buying the right car. Turo has a set of guidelines and they, they vary slightly from country to country. And so like, if anybody's watching this from outside of the United States, be sure that these rules apply to your country as well. But like in, this, in the case of the US, you have to have a car that's 130,000 miles or less. It can't have a branded title. So it has to be clean titled and it has to have, um, it has to be 12 years old or newer. So making sure that you're following those guidelines is, is very, very important because if you're in an accident or your car is in an accident and they find out that your car had rolled back mileage, or it is a salvage title, or it's a 2008 model or 2007, they'll deny your claim and you're going to be out of that car. Okay. Yeah. I think that's a great tip too. Just kind of being upfront, doing your homework before. And then, uh, like we talked about, it seems like Turo does a good job of, you know, valuing their hosts and making sure that they're equal at the end of the day. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. I mean, as long as you read the terms of service, I think that you're setting yourself up for success. Um, kind of change of topic, but you touched on it a little bit earlier, but I want to talk a little bit more about maintenance and like how much time and money it takes. I know you mentioned that your fiance does quite a bit of it and you guys take it to shops, but are you able to touch on that a little bit more? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so yeah, so like back in the day, whenever it was me just managing the cars, I would do a lot of the basic maintenance myself. So things like oil changes, brake changes, occasionally rotor changes. And then pretty much from the start, it's been him, my fiance, his name's HP. Um, but it, it's been HP doing the kind of more intensive stuff. And at, over the years, as he's become more experienced with cars, he can do more and more of that. And then as he's taken over, I've stopped doing it. Like I haven't done an oil change in probably a year at this point, but the, um, but yeah, so we do a lot of the maintenance and then whenever it's a maintenance issue that is just going to be too time consuming, we'll then take it to a shop. And so we've developed a relationship with a really great shop who does a lot of the work at a discount. And so we will take it to them. They'll do it. And so that's in the case of a job just being too long, it's out of our realm of expertise, or it's going to require equipment that we don't have access to. And so in those cases, we'll take it to the shop. But as far as time, I mean, that 20 kind of an hour estimate does take maintenance into account. Like that's kind of the full picture. Maintenance, I think with Turo is all about upkeeping it. I think that as long as you're on top of your maintenance, as long as you're making sure that like everything is being done correctly, I think you'd be surprised at how well cars can operate and how we don't really run into that many issues because their cars are just very consistently maintained. And part of that is like, it's something that I talk about with my fiance a lot is like how nitpicky he is with cars. And I like sometimes will get annoyed about how nitpicky he is. We probably spend about, I would say on average, probably 250 to 350 a month on maintenance, just like just general maintenance. It, it sometimes exceeds that. Um, and so like, I would say, but that's probably around the average that I would say maybe 500, but it's definitely not more than 500 a month on maintenance, which would be like oil changes, things like that. Not tires. Tires is like a different category. That's more expensive. What would you say is like the, the top three biggest like maintenance things, uh, would you say oil change? And then like two other things to always make sure like you're on top of it. Oil changes your tires, like making sure that your tires are the proper PSI is big. Um, and so that's a big one. Another one is that we always run into issues with around this time of year, especially with like people who are in the South is free on like AC is always a big issue whenever it starts to go into the summer months. And so like, I wouldn't say that that's a major one because it's like very cyclical and it's not that costly, but it's one that will sneak up on you. Like inevitably every single year around May and June, guests will be like, Hey, the AC isn't working right. And they're low. The cars are low on Freon because they haven't had to use the AC. And now it's suddenly a hundred degrees. 
So I would say, yeah, tires, oil change, brakes is another big one. Um, making sure your rotors are in good condition. And then, and then, uh, um, yeah, Freon is one that will sneak up on. Man, awesome. And then would you say that like before Turo, you knew how to work on cars or is that comes back to, you know, just doing your homework, do, watching YouTube videos in order to like change the oil or like change the brakes? I would say a combination of both. I've always been interested in cars and I, I had a, like I, I worked on my own cars whenever I was 16. And so it's something that I've always been interested in. But then another part is just like my fiance is a huge car guy, like the biggest car guy I've ever met in my life. So like, you can't really I, we've been together for eight years. And so you can't really be with somebody like that for eight years without just kind of unintentionally absorbing <laughs> knowledge. So that's been a part of it as well. And then a part of it has been just like YouTube. It's like, even today, if I'm doing a job that I know that I can do, I oftentimes will still look up on YouTube, how to change oil on a 2007 Yaris. And like, I'll follow along with a video. And so I, whenever I was going into these like bigger jobs that I hadn't done before, it was heavily relying on YouTube to ensure that I could do it. And then I would oftentimes use my fiance to kind of double check my work to make sure it was done correctly. Okay, awesome, yeah, that's a great little tip. Um, and kind of change of subject. So why did you pick Turo instead of like other platforms out there such as like Get Around? So I did try out Get Around somewhat recently last year and I'm actually currently talking with Get Around as we speak to see like if, if it's worth for me to go back on that platform to give it a try. Um, to be honest, I just think that that Turo is the best platform of them all. Um, with Get Around, the, the downfall is, is that it's so market dependent. Like I, I've talked to hosts and because like the concept of them is relatively the same. Like there's some differences here and there, but like in general, they're the same. And with Get Around, the problem is, is that they weren't released in every part of the United States at the same time. And so there are certain areas where Get Around is significantly more well known. And so like I've heard from hosts in San Diego that Get Around is actually quite a lot better than Turo. But then in Dallas, where Get Around was just released last year, not that many people know what it is. And so a lot of it has come down to just like being busy enough to justify Get Around, in which my case, it wasn't busy enough. So I took my car off. And so with, with, that was kind of the reason why I went with Turo to begin with, because I get around, wasn't available in my city. I didn't even know what it was at the time. Hire car is another alternative that has a really bad reputation. So I didn't even humor that one, but then with Turo, it was the one that was available to me. It's the biggest one. It's the most well-known one. And then you do kind of get into like the routine of like, it's what you know. And so it's harder to veer off into something new whenever you know this one platform so well. And so that's a big part of it as well. And so I don't think, I do think that Turo is the best platform, but I think that like Get Around is definitely worth giving a try. It just really depends on your market. Some markets are, are drastically better than others. Okay. Yeah, I think that's a great tip right there. I think it's funny on like, depending on what market, even if you look to like buy something, I know some areas... Facebook marketplace is like the only place to sell something or other areas that's only like Craigslist or offer up. So it's kind of, yeah, just kind of knowing where everyone does business on. Exactly. All right. And then what percentage like uh, does Turo take in fees? So it depends on your insurance package. So they have a, what they call a protection package. I guess technically it's not insurance, but they do a, the protection package is based off of your deductible in the case of damage. And so they have a 60 they recently changed it. So I, I think, I believe it's 60, 70, 75, 80, and 90. And so depending on that, you, you have a different deductible. So with the 60% plan, you keep 60% of the earnings, Turo keeps 40, but you don't have any deductible if something goes wrong. For me, I'm on the 75% plan. So I pay a $250 deductible and I keep 75% um, of the income. Okay. Um... So they take 25 all right, so I know one of the big questions uh, I know we're going to get is how much money can you make in a month with a single car on Turo? I mean, it's going to drastically depend on the car that you get. Um, like some cars that are higher end cars can make two, three thousand dollars per month. I do think that that's kind of a little bit of a, the exception to the rule. It also will, of course, depend on your market as well. And the thing about Turo too, with like how much you can make per car, it depends also from like a month to month, like some cars, if you have multiple smoking claims, you'll probably make more off of that than if you didn't have any for us, the average car, I mean, we on average probably make between 800 and a thousand a month on the cars, um, per car. And then like some of our best cars make significantly more than that. Like our Mercedes C 300, which is a 2009 that consistently does about 1300 a month. Oh, wow. And is that profit or total revenue? That's revenue. So after expenses, 
expenses for each car is about, um, like with insurance tires and things like that, it's about three to $400 per month. Okay. Even that though. So going back to like how much you paid for your economy cars, it seems like a great, you know, return on investment right there. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So yeah, it seems yeah very profitable. And then what we talked so far with having 15 cars right now in the fleet and looking to grow, it, it's really something that you're able to, you know, kind of grow into a little business for uh, Turo and it's something that I could really scale up pretty quickly. It seems like. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of hosts, like I, I have 15 cars, but I'm still considered a small host. And so there's a lot of hosts that have, you know, 75, 50 cars, a hundred cars. I think the biggest host has like two or 300. And so it's definitely a scalable business model. And of course those are, are kind of at that point, like their own rental car companies to an extent, but there are people that just like me that like operate with their husband or wife or best friend. That have 50, 50 cars. And so it's definitely scalable. Do you think with one person you could scale up to two, three hundred, or is that where you need several employees in order to make sure that you know everything's taken care of, whether it's maintenance, pictures, insurance claims, and all that? Oh, I mean, you would at at seventy five cars. I think you would need to at least have some sort of help. I think it's definitely like something that you could still do as like a, a pretty small operation, where like for example, with with me and my cars, it was done. I was doing it basically by myself. And then my fiance was helping a couple of hours a week, a week. And it wasn't until we got to 10 cars where it was like, this is becoming too much for myself, given the fact that I was also doing these other side projects as well, since we were both working on a full time. And I think that with like where I'm currently at with 15 cars, we've kind of set it to where like, okay, once we get to 25 cars, that might be where we think about hiring some part-time help. And so I think that like, you could probably in based off of what I do, like you could probably get to 75 with maybe like one full-time worker and then like some on and off help. The big difficulty that like you, that's really hard with Turo that I I would say is the only big downside is if you need to take a break for any reason, you're kind of out of options. And so that's where having a set of hands that can help you comes into play. Because if you have 75 cars and you're wanting to go on vacation for a week, you're not going to want to unlist all of those cars. You're going to want somebody to come in and help you take care of those. And so I definitely think there's a point where like you need help in some way, shape or form. Okay. Yeah. I have like several follow-up questions, but I feel like it kind of seems like whatever you want to make out of the business, whether it's something that's pretty passive, maybe just put your personal car, or you really want to grow this and scale this into a full-time business, you have like the opportunity to potentially replace your nine to five job. But at the end of the day, it kind of depends what your goals are with uh, Turo. Yeah. I mean, a hundred percent. And I think that that's one of the, the wonderful things of Turo is that like, it's so dictated on what you want to accomplish for me. You know, I, I don't think I have the desire to own 300 cars. Like I, I mean, maybe who knows, but that's definitely not in the cards for me right now. Like I'm working to 25 and then I'll reevaluate from there, but there is definitely the ability for an everyday person to get to 15, 20 cars and make good six figure income. But then if you're not, that's not your style, you don't want to do that, then get one or two cars and you can make an extra one to $2,000 per month. And so it really is really great for any type of like side hustle entrepreneur based on your goals, your availability, your lifestyle, your budget. So it's super customizable. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. It's flexible with whatever you're trying to accomplish then. Mm -hmm. What about, is it like too late to get started with Turo? Do you think like the market's, you know, getting too saturated? I feel like you you see a lot more videos on YouTube about it. And even on the app, there's, I know I think I first rented my first car in Turo, I think I want to say a couple of years ago in Chicago, but now there just seems a lot more inventory. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely, it's hard for me to say just because, so I, I guess like the blanket statement is no, I don't think it's too late. Are new hosts going to have a harder time getting started than more experienced hosts? Probably just because I I know for sure that whenever you talk about the Turo algorithm, like I know with YouTube, like the YouTube algorithms, like this elusive thing, but the Turo algorithm sort of is as well. And I know that one of the things that the Turo algorithm looks for is like the history of the profile. And so as a result of that, I'm going to have a benefit over somebody that's getting started just now. But I think that it's, as long as you just stick to it, like you're going to get rentals. Like I'm in the Turo Facebook groups. I'm in, like, I watch Turo videos myself. Like I'm not only a YouTuber in this space, but I'm also like a consumer of the content in this space. And I see hosts every day that, and I have a course in this space. And so I have, you know, a network of 700 course members that are brand new to Turo or relatively new to Turo who got started three, four, five months ago and are now having five, six, seven cars. And so, um, I, I guess I shouldn't even hesitate to that answer. The answer is no, but you might have some set of unique 
challenges that maybe I don't experience today, but like you can absolutely be successful with it. Okay. So just kind of yeah, doing your homework, you know, deciding what car works well in your, in your, your town or city. And then I guess kind of catering to that. So yeah, I feel like if you do your homework, it sounds like there's plenty of opportunity left then to be successful. Yeah. A hundred percent. Do your homework, figure out which car is the best car for your market, buy below market value. So whichever car you get, make sure that you don't overpay for it and you'll be set up for success. I mean, if you, if you're in a market where there's a bunch of expensive cars and none of them are getting rented out, it's probably not a good idea to get expensive cars. But as long as you look at your market, pay attention to trends and see what is getting rented out and what isn't, you're going to be golden. Okay. Yeah. That's an awesome tip. And then I guess, who would you recommend uh, for people to not use Turo? Like, is there a certain type of people or maybe the people don't have the right tools or cars? Like, who would you recommend to kind of avoid using it? That's a good question. Um, there's definitely a group of people that I would recommend not using it, but I guess it's like more so I look at these people that like I hear stories and then I'm like, why are you even on Turo? But I don't know, like, I don't know how to classify them into one group. So I guess one is unfortunately the world of Turo is like a customer support based business. Like you have to be good at dealing with people. And I'm somebody that like, I can be a little short tempered sometimes, especially if I feel like I'm right with something and I just have to swallow my pride and just like accept whatever the guest is telling me is going on as fact. And so with Turo, you're going to deal with a lot of guests that are wrong about the platform because it's a new platform and like it's not their fault. They've never used it before. So there's going to be a lot of confusion with guests. There's going to be a lot of guests that think they're right about something, but they're not right. And you just have to like smile and give them the answer that they're looking for because reviews and like being nice to the customer, the customer is always right mentality. It's really important. So I would say the first type of person is like, if you can't do that, and if you're going to have a short fuse, and if you're going to like wanting to prove the guest wrong, like your time on Turo is going to be limited because Turo kicks posts off of their platform if they have bad reviews. So that's kind of the first one. And then I would say the second, if, if you're looking for something that requires no work from your end, and you're looking for those side hustles that you can kind of take shortcuts with Turo isn't for you because unfortunately with, well, I guess it's fortunately and unfortunately is that Turo is one of those side hustles that if you play the, by the rules, you will be successful. Like you will be successful. But if you're looking for ways to shortcut those rules, or if you're looking to do your own thing, or if you're looking to like go kind of around these rules that have been set, you're not only going to set yourself up for failure, but whenever that failure happens, it's going to be like an atomic bomb in the case of a car getting wrecked and you're not getting covered or Turo finding out and banning you. And now you're stuck with this car with a car payment. There's just a lot of things that can go wrong. So if you're not going to play by the rules, you're probably better off just not joining. Okay. And I guess that kind of leads us into our, our next question is what's like the, the worst part about Turo? And then also on the flip side, what's like the best part? I mean, honestly, I, I, I never really like this question because I always feel like it comes off as me being like, I I've been accused a number of times on my channel of being a paid promoter of Turo, which <laughs> isn't true. Um, and I feel like it comes off like that way whenever I answer this question, but like, to be honest, there isn't a whole lot that I don't like about Turo. Like Turo has changed my life for the better. It is an incredible platform. I think that Turo as a whole, like it truly can change your life. And I am convinced that anybody who has a really bad experience with Turo probably was doing something wrong. And so I would say in general, a lot of the rules that they have, even if they're ones that I don't particularly love, like having to take photos every 24 hours, like I see why they're there and like, I understand the purpose behind them. And so there really isn't anything that I, I really truly dislike about the platform. I would say maybe like those occasional difficult guests, but that's business. You're going to deal with those people regardless. And then as far as like what my best is, it's just, it's the ability to go into a platform and truly scale it. I think that there is very few business models that are as passive as Turo. It's not fully passive, but it is semi-passive. There's a few business models that are as passive as Turo that can produce the returns of Turo. And I think whenever you compare it to investments, like even real estate, there are very few that have that ROI that you can get from renting out cars. And I just think it really is a game changer. That's awesome to hear. And yeah, going back to your, your first point, it's funny that you're saying people accuse you, but I feel like it's, if you're passionate about a side hustle and it turns into, you know, a great business for you and it's, you know, obviously been really successful for you. So it's like, of course, you're only gonna have to say positive things, or if you didn't have all these positive things, you already probably would have left the platform and done a different kind of side exactly. hustle. Exactly. And people fail to, people fail to like make that connection. It's like, if I hated the platform, I wouldn't be on it. 
Like yeah, I've, I've exactly. been on a, yeah. yeah. And so it's, but it's probably once a month. Somebody goes, are you sure you don't work for Turo or <laughs> are you a, like a mole for Turo or something? It happens often. And I'm just like, no, I'm not. I've actually never worked for Turo. I don't get special treatment with Turo. Like I'm just a, a run of the mill host, like everybody else. But I just like, I truly do believe that the, the platform can change your life. If you are into that type of thing. And if you're looking for a side hustle. Yeah, definitely. And I guess kind of wrapping up this whole interview, the last two questions we have is, is there anything that you wish you would have known before getting started, uh, before renting cars on Turo? I mean, not really, to be honest. I would say I wish I would have started growing faster, um, which I think is kind of a cliche answer because it's like, my only mistake is that I didn't grow faster. I don't know. I, I don't like that answer either, but it's the, I, I probably, there was a period of time where I stopped buying cars because I wasn't sure about the viability of Turo and I regret doing that. And I think the additionally is transitioning into my LLC sooner was a bit of a mistake because then it was just like a mess getting everything organized. And so I would say probably my, my biggest regret, but it, it's not even really a regret, but my biggest, I guess, piece of advice for people getting started is make sure everything gets organized from the get go, because I didn't treat Turo like a business at the beginning. I treated it like this thing I was just kind of doing. And from a finance standpoint, it ended up hurting me in the long run. And then whenever it came to turning it into a legitimate business, like what it is today, I had to go back. I had to like do all of these steps that really shouldn't have been necessary. So if you're going to go into Turo, treat it like a business from the start. And I think that you'll be in a, in a better position than I was. Okay. And then that way too, it just what it keeps everything more organized. So it doesn't sound like if I don't know, you have to go back, whether it's financial tax reasons, it's a lot easier if you're a hundred percent. Yeah. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. And then the other final question we have, is there, I guess, any final tips or anything you want to say to anyone who's looking to get started on Turo? Yeah. I mean, I would say read the terms of service. There's a lot of resources out there for Turo hosts who are wanting to get started. I mean, of course I'm biased. I have a YouTube channel that talks about this. So if you're interested in that, check it out. I also have a course, but even aside from that, I mean, there's tons of Facebook groups that are super helpful. Like back whenever I started Turo on YouTube wasn't a thing. And so I used Facebook groups and I reached out to more experienced hosts and asked for their advice. And so nowadays, like there's so much more resources than there, than there used to be. So utilizing Facebook groups, utilizing YouTube, utilizing these resources, and just making sure that you're educated in what you're doing. And there are so many free resources out there. Okay. Yeah. And we'll definitely be leaving links down below to your channel, of course. And then also if anyone wants to take a look at your course and then I, Facebook groups that you would recommend as well. So if anyone wants to take a look at any of those resources, they'll be all linked down below. Yeah, absolutely. There's a bunch of different Facebook ones and I'm not affiliated with any of them, but I can definitely, uh, I'll make sure to provide you with, with some of those good ones that, that people can check out. All right. Awesome. But yeah, I just want to thank you for your time today and helping us learn a lot more about Turo as a, a side hustle and also growing it to a business. So yeah, thank you for all your tips and advice. I really do appreciate it. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Of course. I'll talk to you later. Take care. Bye. Thank you. A huge thanks to Aubrey again for all the great advice and tips on how you can start making thousands of dollars in potential profits with renting your car on Turo. If you want to learn more about Turo or other side hustles that Aubrey has personally tried, feel free to check out her channel and subscribe. Please leave a comment down below what side hustle you would like for me to do an interview for next. If this video brought you any kind of value, please make sure to subscribe and share the video. Feel free to check out all my other videos on my channel about personal side hustles that I have tried and to learn more about personal finance. I'll see you guys in the next one and this is Kevin, your financial tutor, signing off. Peace.